Welcome everybody for yet another episode of Contemplate or Your Life. The show where your life is being contemplated as if your life depends on it, because it does. Well, today I'll be starting a new lecture series focusing on the most important philosophical questions according to Immanuel Kant. And the first one of these is going to be what can we know? And uh, it kind of makes sense that it is, this is a really huge and, and important philosophical question. Because, you know, before that we construct entire images of the world and we try to explain the big questions like, is there a God and what's the good thing to do? What is this world made of? Before we even could try to answer all these questions, we should ask ourselves this one first. What can we know? Can we talk about such difficult subjects. Is our knowledge sufficient to really know it? Well, we'll be exploring this question in part philosophically, because Kant meant it that way, but of course uh, we'll be broadening our scopes and we'll try to answer it with, let's say, a deeper understanding of what knowledge might be. Okay, let's first dig into how Immanuel Kant must have meant it. In his time, in the early 19th century, uh, there were basically two camps when it came to the question uh, where does knowledge come from? And this is the domain of uh, epistemology uh, and it has basically two questions. Uh, where does knowledge come from? And uh, how can we justify having certain forms of knowledge? Well, the two camps were rationalism on the one hand that says Knowledge really comes from reason, from your mind, let's say. And the other camp is empiricism, that basically says knowledge comes from the senses, from experience. Um, well, Kant sort of uh, reconciled those two camps by saying, well, there's not really no such thing as pure um, experience. Experience is always, let's say, hierarchical. Uh, you have a certain concepts of what uh, the world is and you expect to see certain things so there are categories he says to um, to experiencing the world all right that's fine so you can say those are the categories of the mind so it's a little bit of both he says you know if you just have the mind you have no content of which it can be aware of so that would be the part of empiricism experience experiencing but if you don't have the experiences, you have just an empty mind. So he basically, we could compare it to a computer. Let's say you have a, a really good computer that you buy now, but you have no games or movies or anything to, to put on your hard drive. So then you would have, let's say, only mind and no experience. But if you have a really old computer with, um, let's say, a computer from the 80s, and you have a game from, from the 2000s that you want to play, of course, your computer is going to crash. So um, the content is too big to process. So you could that, that could be a useful metaphor. All right, but let's go beyond that. Is this really all there is to uh, what knowing is? Isn't there a form of knowing that might be deeper, that might might go beyond what we can reason, reasonably know or what we can experience? Well, uh, the question, of course, arises. Uh, can we know what we can't know? So Kant tried to answer this question and in order to answer it in a way you have to know what you can't know and knowing what you can't know is obviously knowing. So um, there's quite a bit of a paradox there. Well, uh, we can also try to answer this question in a scientific manner because we know that knowledge can be basically brought down into bits of information. And we can act actively measure the maximum amount of information that our brains can hold. And according to the scientist Thomas Landauer, we have a, a gigabyte, a maximum a gigabyte of information. That's not really too much, is it? You can go to the store uh, and buy some, some USB stick that carries 32 gigabytes for about 6 euros. So our one gig, gigabyte of information really isn't that much. Uh, all right, let's try to dig deeper into what other kinds of knowledge we might have. 
the Greeks basically said, uh, if you want knowledge, you must dig into yourself. Uh, this is the famous Oracle of Delphi. And uh, the Greeks, well, superstitious as they were, they always, when they had some big venture coming, of course, they always consulted the Oracle first. Uh, like this famous story of, of a king who uh, went to the Oracle to ask for advice, and he really wanted to start a war against his biggest enemy. Uh, and he went to the Oracle with that question, should I start the war? And, and the Oracle said, if you start the war, you will destroy uh, a great empire. And he obviously thought that he would destroy his enemy. Then he went to war and he lost. And obviously what he should have realized is uh, that he would go on to destroy his own empire. So had he had a little bit of self-knowledge, and that's basically what this here is about, had he had a little bit of self-knowledge, uh, he would have known. So, and that goes back to Kant as well. If we expect some knowledge from the world, we must first know what is the eye that is knowing, because we will, maybe we want to see certain things, and we know this from all sorts of experiments in, in 20th century psychology. You know, when you have people in a lab, and you, you, you let them choose some sort of product, and then you ask why they would choose that spe uh, specific product, they would come with all sorts of reasons, even if we you know, change the product that they chose. If a person, let's say, uh, gets pictures of, of women, and uh, he kind of likes the, the brunette women, and then later on you, you pretend like he said he likes the, the blonde women, then he would still come up with reasons as to why he chose the blonde women. So um, maybe we're deceiving ourselves quite a bit here. And just as the king should have known that he should have known himself, uh, that's just the way that we should dig into ourselves and see what we can know. So maybe uh, the root to knowledge lies in knowledge of the self. That's why on the temple of the oracle it was inscripted, Knotisiapu, know thyself. So you should really know yourself before you can claim to know anything. And that's why the famous, famous philosopher Socrates uh, said, in oita odi, odi uden oida, which means, you know, all the only thing I know is that I know nothing. And um, well, that always struck me as, as a very deep sense of, of self-knowledge because we've already talked earlier about, let's say, the famous Dunning-Kruger effect that basically says that the less you know, uh, the less that you know that you know so little. So basically, if you know just a little bit, you think that you're really amazing. And if you get to know more, then you gradually realize that there's more to know. So if Socrates says something like, uh, I know nothing except the fact of my ignorance. And for a part, he has some true wisdom there, but on the other hand, you know, let's say if you study philosophy like I have, and you read all these really, really thick books, you spend all these years studying it, and then at the end, you have to conclude, I really know nothing. That, that's what it was all about. I think there's uh, maybe more to knowledge than we think. Let's consider Taoism here for a second. And let's consider um, what they say about the ultimate knowledge. One of the main phrases in Taoism is uh, the Tao that can be spoken about is not the real Tao. And Tao is usually translated as the way or the path or something. But it has a point here. Because when we claim to know something, and if we want to speak about something, we do it in language, obviously. And what is language? Language is a linear phenomenon, you know, one thing after another, and it's symbolical. We use symbols to try to describe a part of reality, but of course reality isn't those symbols itself. And reality is non-linear, it happens, you know, all over the place, all the time. Uh, so can we really expect to express the fundamentals of what the world is in language. No, maybe not. And there's knowledge to you as well that you cannot probably express in language. Do you, do you know how to make blood cells? Well, you, you probably couldn't describe it to me, but your body knows how to do it. Do you know how to uh, pump the blood through your body? Well, you, you can probably ex not explain it to me unless you're a cardiologist, but your heart knows how to do it. Just in the same way, as you know, you know how to, to run, you know how to walk. Maybe you know how to play an instrument and you cannot 
express all the things that you're doing with your instrument in language, nevertheless, the fact that you're doing it shows that you know quite a bit about it. So, what can we know? Maybe we can know more than we think we know. Um, and that leads me to uh, the, a point that stems from Jung, Carl Jung, the brilliant Swiss psychologist, who said, well, um, there's a really a lot, of, a lot of things that we know through our collective unconscious. So the, the, the symbolism, the stories, we sort of know that. And that's why we see so much parallels in all the mythologies and even in dreams all over the world, in all cultures. There's a deeper form of knowledge that we already sort of know, even though we cannot always explicitly say how we know it or, or what it is that we're, we're knowing. So uh, maybe there's a lot more to knowledge than we think. Uh, there's more to reason and there's more to the senses. Uh, and in our next episode, we'll discuss how this relates to our actions in the world, how we should act and how we can know uh, how we should act. But I think that there's quite a knowledge to be found in there as well. So thank you all for watching this episode of Contemplate or Your Life. And I will hope to see you again soon.